Good evening. My name is Barry Scherer, and I'm the provost here at Dartmouth College. And I would like to welcome you to this conference marking the centennial of the Portsmouth P Peace Treaty. Dartmouth is very pleased to be hosting this conference, which celebrates perhaps the most important diplomatic event in New Hampshire's history. The participants in this conference have come from North America, from Russia, and from Japan. And we're grateful to all for, hel for helping us put together what promises to be an informative and thought-provoking event. I want to recognize our partners in this conference, the International House of Japan, the Kennan Institute, represented at the conference by Ambassador Thomas Simons, and the Portsmouth Peace Treaty Anniversary Committee, under the leadership of Charles Doliak, who is also in attendance at the conference. Financial support has come from the U.S.-Japan Friendship Commission, the Center for Global Partnership of the Japan Foundation, and the Kennan Institute, as well as here at Dartmouth, from the Dickey Center, and from both the Provost and Dean of Faculty offices. I'd like to take special note of several of those here this evening. John McLean was governor of New Hampshire when the peace treaty was signed, and it was instrumental in bringing the conference to the, to, to the state. Uh, uh, three of his descendants, Leland McLean Bradley, along with Charles and Malcolm McLean, who are both Dartmouth graduates, are, are, are here with us th th this evening as well. And we're honored to, to have present both Shinichi Kitaoka, representative of Japan to the United Nations, and Japan's acting consul general in Boston, Masayuki Takashima. Our goal over the next couple of days will be to offer the insights of scholars, diplomats, and other pr practitioners on, on the war, uh, on the war, on its diplomatic and military lessons, and of course, on the peace treaty itself, as well as on the cultural and political legacies of the settlement. Following tonight's keynote address, the conference will feature a series of panels over the next two days in the 1902 room of Baker Library, where each of these topics will be explored in detail, followed by a special two-part panel on Saturday and Saturday evening back here in Filene Auditorium. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those who are most responsible for carrying out the huge task of preparing for an international gathering of this scope and complexity. Ron Edsforth had the original idea for the conference while Ambassador Kenneth Yalowitz, the director of the Dickey Center, and his staff, with a special note of thanks to Rob Clough, worked tirelessly on the logistics for this event. The entire steering committee for the conference assisted with the planning, but I want to acknowledge particularly the efforts of two individuals, Alan Hockley and Steve Erickson, who put in endless hours planning and preparing for the conference. And again, I want to thank all of you for, for all your efforts in this regard. We note this centennial in no small part because the Peace Conference marked a new stage in the history of United States diplomacy and influence. When a Portsmouth Treaty was signed some 100 years and three days ago, the United States was not yet playing so major a role on the world stage as it has since World War II, but it was already an emerging power. In particular, it was a new force in the Pacific with the, recent, with the then recent annexations of Hawaii and the Philippines. For that reason alone, the United States was more, was more than an interested onlooker in the major war that was taking place many thousands of, of miles away from its western coast. And in Theodore Roosevelt, the United States had a president who was both a fierce pro proponent of an American presence in, in international affairs and deeply knowledgeable about both Russia and Japan. It was, it, it was at his behest that continued representations were made to the warring parties even after initial rebuffs from both sides might have deterred a less determined individual. With Russian reluctance to take part in negotiations finally ended by its massive naval defeat at the Battle of Tsushima in May of 1905, preparations for a peace conference moved quickly forward. The conference itself lasted nearly a month, from August 8th of 1905 until the signing of the P peace treaty on September 5th. Theodore Roosevelt did not attend the actual sessions, but he greeted the delegates when he arrived in, in the United States and maintained active back-channel diplomacy from his summer residence in Oyster Bay, Long Island. In the following year, he received the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to bring the two parties together. And not just the president, but the United States itself emerged with far greater prestige for helping to end a war that had the potential to grow into a still greater conflagration. If the conference was of great national significance, it was simil similarly of no small importance for New Hampshire and the city of Portsmouth. The choice of Portsmouth arose from a combination of factors. We're one to judge on the basis of many accounts, 
It owed its selection as much as anything to the fact that those were the days before air conditioning. Washington, D.C., <laughs> the nation's capital and site pre preferred by the Japanese, was known for its hot, muggy summers. And New Hampshire could usually, but as, we've all, as many of us up here have just seen, not always, <laughs> be counted upon to offer a more uh, modern alternative. Uh, but the reluctance, especially on the part of the Russian delegation, to go to Washington was not just based on personal comfort. Both public and official opinion in the United States were, were more on the side of the Japanese. Russia was viewed with, sus with suspicion for its expansionist aims in the Far East, and the Tsarist regime had in recent years been receiving negative coverage for its harsh treatment of political dissidents. Washington, and for that matter New York, were thus seen by the Russians as possibly unfriendly locales. Conversely, some other possible sites were regarded as areas where local opinion might be more on the side of the Russians. Portsmouth, in addition to its usually cooler climate, offered some distance from the centers of sentiment on either side. While, as home to a major U.S. naval yard, it had excellent communications, a vital consideration both for the delegations and for Roosevelt himself, and it also offered good security. What is more, both the state and the city took an active role in offering themselves as a site for the conference. The New Hampshire Executive Council extended a formal invitation to both sides to host the negotiations in, in late June of 1905. And shortly afterwards, the New Hampshire Secretary of State and both its senators met with Russian and Japanese diplomats in Washington. By July 10th of that year, all sides had agreed on Portsmouth as the locale for the, for the conference. The city went on to prove a most welcoming and accommodating host, create, creating an atmosphere which eased the tense periods that arose during the in actual negotiations, and thus playing no small role in ensuring the conference's success. In 1904, shortly after the outbreak of the war, an individual at Dartmouth, Kenichi As As Asakawa, wrote an article on the Russell, on, um, on the Russell-Japanese War published in the Yale Review, and a few months later published a book, The Russell-Japanese War, Its Causes and Issues. Asakawa was the first person from Japan to, to graduate f f from Dartmouth, and he had gone on already at that point to receive a PhD from Yale, had come back to Dartmouth to teach. He then served as uh, a, an official observer on the part of the Japanese government at the, at the peace treaty conference it's, itself. Asakawa in 1907 went back to Yale. We had an, an illustrious career and is generally regarded as one of the founders of East Asian studies in the United States. So in that sense alone, Dartmouth itself, as, along with the city of Portsmouth and the United States as a whole, had a small, ha, Dartmouth had its own small part to play uh, 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 in these treaty n negotiations. It's Asakawa himself was one of the first to understand the, the significance of the war extended far beyond its immediate ge geographical theater. Histor historians have taken to, re to referring to the Russo-Japanese War, as many of you have, have no doubt read in materials related to this conference, as World War Zero, which seems a particularly apt designation. The Zero serves as a reminder that in many ways this was not really a world war, at least not one on a scale that the 20th century was to experience subsequently. The casualties were measured only and that only is in quotation marks, in the scores of thousands rather than in the millions. Civilian suffering was certainly noteworthy among the local Ch Chinese population, and Chinese, because the conflict it will, be, it will be called, did not really take place in either Russian or Japanese soil, but for the most part in Man Manchuria. And yet that suffering did not match what civilians were to endure in, in either World War I or World War II. In terms of armaments, 1905 was too early for air combat to play any sort of a role, nor had tank warfare come into being. And of course, the fighting was between just two nations, without the complex alliances and multiple theaters of operation in both the world wars. Yet, in many ways, the Russo-Japanese conflict was, in fact, an all-too-fitting predecessor to the wars that were to follow. Consider the Battle of Mukden, where about 270,000 soldiers on each side took part, with a casualty count in dead and wounded that exceeded 160,000. The sheer number of troops involved, the logistics of the engagement, and the modern armaments that were brought to bear, machine guns, rapid fire artillery, the use of barbed wire in the field, served to alter the very nature of fighting. This was a battle unlike any the world had yet seen. And then there was a decisive naval in battle in, in, the, streets of, in the Straits of Tsushima. 
The Russian fleet had sailed some 18,000 miles from the Baltic Sea and around the Horn of Africa, an epic journey that was thoroughly chronicled in the world press, only to be completely routed, actually annihilated would be probably the more apt word, as soon as it arrived in the Far East. The Japanese used torpedo boats and high explosive shells containing an incendiary acid that wreaked, that wreaked, wreaked havoc among the Russian crews and turned ships into infernos. Early in that engagement, the Russian vessel, Aslabia, gained a dubious place in history by becoming the first armored battleship to be sunk by gun gunfire. Thus, the weaponry, both on land and at sea, had attained a new and more terrible level of effectiveness and destruction. In other, reg in other regards, too, the modern use of communications, the skilled efforts by both sides to, co to collect intelligence, and the propaganda machines that, 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 that both unleashed there was much in this war that anticipated wars to come. And finally, the Russo-Japanese conflict marked the moment at which the major powers were no longer confined just to Europe. Japan, with its skills on land and its dominance on the seas, had announced itself as a force with which the rest of the world would have to reckon. Given the war's importance for Japan, we are particularly pleased to have as our keynote speaker for the conference, John Dower the Elton E. Morrison Professor of History at, at, at MIT. Professor Dower is perhaps best known for his book, Embracing Defeat, Japan in the Wake of World War II. That study was awarded virtually every honor that a book on a historical topic could receive, including the Pulitzer, the National Book Award in Nonfiction, the Bancroft Prize in American History, the John K. F Fairbank Prize in Asian History, and many others. It is a book of great depth and, equal, and equally great breadth, an inquiry that is richly informed by a profound knowledge of modern Japan, and yet a work that is written with wonderful clarity, grace, and wit. The, the volume is rich in insight with observations that have significance far beyond the immediate topic. Thus, in emphasizing the importance of language in post-war Japan, Professor Dower comments that words mattered. People came alive through words. They crossed from past to future on bridges of language. In a chapter titled, What Do You Tell the Dead When You Lose? He notes that the victors could comfort the, the souls of, the dead, of their dead and console themselves by reporting that the outcome of the war had been great and good. Triumph gave a measure of closure to grief. Defeat left the meaning of those war deaths, of kin, acquaintances, once compatriots in general, raw and open. His numerous other publications include War Without Mercy, Race and Power in the, Pacific War, in, the, in the Pacific War, which itself received several prizes, Empire and Aftermath, a study of the life and times of the diplomat and later Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru, and Japan in War and Peace, Selected Essays. Beyond his scholarly work, he has engaged in a public debate over American historical memory and foreign policy, especially the role of racial prejudice in, in, in stimulating mass violence and the moral implications of civilian bombing. He has spoken out recently about the analogies, or lack of them, between the occupation of Iraq and the occupation of Japan. Professor Dower has, has also served as the executive producer of a documentary film entitled Hellfire, A Journey from, from, from Hiroshima, which was nominated in 1988 for an Academy Award. He has broken new ground through his scholarly use of visual materials and other expressions of popular culture in examining Japanese and U.S. Asian history, and is currently engaged in a project on visualizing cultures, which is aimed at wedding the analytical insights of historical and cultural analysis to an extensive digital database of visual images. That current interest is reflected in the title of tonight's talk, Represent Representations of a New Japan, Images from the Russo-Japanese War. Please join me in welcoming John Dower. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, we, we've seemed to be having a number of anniversaries coming uh, all together now. Last year was 150 years after Perry's arrival in Japan. Uh, this year is, is many anniversaries. The one that many of us think of 
most of all is 60 years since Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the end of World War II. Uh, it's 100 years. We're here today to uh, talk about 100 years since the end of the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Uh, it's also the 110th anniversary of the end of the Sino-Japanese War when Japan had its first conflict with China and, and that ended in 1895. So the 60th anniversary and the 100th and the 110th are, are really very, uh, these are watershed events and, and we, we stand today and we tro still try to assess what they, uh, what they mean to the present and to the future. And in certain ways, where most Americans are focusing on the 60-year anniversary of the end of World War II, uh, which brought us into the nuclear age, if you look at Asia, the other anniversaries, the Russo-Japanese War and the Sino-Japanese War, are really momentous events uh, in the history of Asia. And you can say they really ushered in the Japanese century in Asia, that the 20th century in Asia was Japan's century, uh, both before and after World War II. And it's a coincidence, but now at this very moment we stand on the cusp of a new era when the, uh, the next century in good part will be China's century. Uh, certainly the balance has shifted. but. Uh, so this is a very momentous uh, event, and it, it's something that we have to think about for past and what it means for the future. What I want to do with you tonight is to go back and look at the way in which particularly the Russo-Japanese War was portrayed and literally seen at the time. And this is uh, to introduce you to a project that we have been developing at MIT called Visualizing Cultures, uh, and <coughs> these are websites. And this is the website at which they will all be up, ideally by October 15th, um, and uh, they, I'll, I'll tell you how you can get into them right now. Uh, the first site we did was on Perry, uh, and then there is a site up on of the treaty ports that were opened after Perry, the so-called Yokohama Prince, their first impressions of Westerners in Japan uh, in the 1860s. We did a, a unit um, for the anniversary of the 60th Ground Zero 1945. It's a subject that I've thought a great deal about, uh, particularly in the light of the way we use Ground Zero today. This was done in collaboration with the uh, Hiroshima Peace Museum. These are the drawings of survivors. This was done in collaboration with the Freer Gallery, Sackler Freer in Washington, D.C. This is their co uh, collection. What I want to introduce you to tonight uh, is a collaboration that we have uh, developing now with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And the Visualizing Cultures project is uh, an attempt to bring together visual resources with text and analysis and to use the new technologies of, that we have now to make these available and then to be able to make them accessible to people at all levels including a lot of outreach public education below, below the university level so that the programs are now being developed with lesson plans for middle school and high school and so on. What, what I want to show you tonight is uh, something that's never been seen before. In fact, we wrapped it up last night. Um, <coughs> and um, this is the graphics on the Sino and particularly the Russo-Japanese War that are at the Museum of Fine Arts. Now these are mostly graphics that are in the archives and many have never been seen before. And people are moving into a new world where museums are saying we have a mission to let people see what we have uh, and we should try to get it out and make it as accessible as possible and we now have the technologies to do this. And if, should you be interested in going back and, and getting wired tonight, you can't use the uh, MIT site yet because we're still, it's getting loaded, it'll be up the middle of next month, but this would get you right now into the three units that I'm going to introduce you to uh, tonight. 
And eventually, these will have very uh, dense databases that can be tapped into, and we're developing links that actually will link us into the databases of museums. It's very, very exciting, well, pedagogically, as a sense of, of doing public education at many levels. I wanted to share some of this with you. It was very exciting for me, and I basically have been looking at the graphics that MFA had in, in some depth since the beginning of this year. And the first unit uh, called Throwing Off Asia, this is up. This is the most complex thing we have done. Uh, this is, uh, takes the phrase, throwing off Asia. It's a very famous phrase for any of you who are familiar with Japan. It was a famous phrase in the 1880s, datsua. Uh, throwing off Asia meant to, it meant several things. It meant to throw off the past that has kept us backward. Japan must throw off its traditional path, past and take the path of Western, Westernization and modernization. And then that literally, uh, rather than figuratively, became throwing off China and Korea, because they were backward. And uh, so the concept was that Japan, to become a modern power, must throw off Asia. And this is a very interesting concept, because they would then Westernize. And when we used to, when I began, uh, studying Japan, we spoke of Westernization very much in terms of fashions and uh, parliaments and Western uh, cultural ways, but Westernization also meant a mastery of modern war and a mastery of empire. And that's what takes place at this moment. And when the Japanese really threw off Asia and did it vividly and graphically was in the war against China. And, uh, the way in which, uh, in 1894 and 1895, and the way in which the war against China uh, was portrayed in Japan at that time, the primary way in which people saw the war was through woodblock prints. And one of the finest collection of woodblock prints of the Sino-Japanese War is in the Museum of Fine Arts. And it's the Schaff collection. It's a superb collection. Uh, when we began this project, only about 100 or more of the, wood, of the war prints had been digitized, and we did another, uh, two, another 150, and many of these are, are up there now. And what this unit basically does, uh, each unit, I won't tell you about these, all these details because uh, what we have, but uh, the key is what we call a core exhibit, and a core exhibit um, is text uh, woven with um, with um, with graphics, this particular unit probably has two 250, 300, uh, 300 images in the core exhibit. I won't go through this with you. Just I just want to give you a little taste of it. This is a, a spectacular visual unit. Just, just give you a taste for the types of things you'll find in it. The greatest of the woodblock artists was a man named Kiyo Chika of the war artists, and probably one of the greatest of, of the Meiji era woodblock artists. He was churning these out. The war lasted 10 months. We think he did around 70 woodblock prints. He was just tossing them off. And they are simply extraordinary works of art. And this was just our working uh, Gra list of graphics by Kiyo Chika that we were using to see what we had by Kiyo Chika, and it was so beautiful, we said, well, we'll throw this into the site itself, and then the site then simply goes on to look at the Kiyo Chika uh, graphics. That's what's in here, and then we go through the type of work that Kiyo Chika was doing. So this is the kind of thing you will find in this site. Now, what was interesting to me was that we know they were doing wonderful woodblock prints of the Sino-Japanese War, and this is the place you can see them now in ways you never could before, because now they're up, and we've used the new technologies to get them up. What was interesting is uh, if you go to exhibitions, the art exhibitions usually are exhibitions which uh, say woodblock prints of the Sino and Russo-Japanese War. When you go on, and this unit ends with, we've, we've done all of the, um, the China prints up to this point, uh, which I call throwing off Russia, 
And this is the moment when Japan, in, when it says it's going to throw off Asia and become like the, the West, use, this is the moment when they literally throw off China and China becomes contemptible. And when we used to do the kind of textual analysis of the war, Donald Keene did brilliant work looking at songs, poetry, popular writings at the time of that war in 1894-95. That's when racism and contempt for China became very, very strong and very shocking because Japan had been so indebted in the past to China. When you look at the woodblock prints, that's where you can see them saying we're very different from the Chinese. And what this uh, up the Chinese section does is show the very complexity of these prints in which the Japanese appear very Western and the Chinese appear very old fashioned and the Chinese are treated with contempt. And at one point in the unit, I actually, uh, because the racism is so strong, I throw in a uh, pop-up click on to Punch magazine, the British magazine, to show that the Japanese are basically using stereotypes and racial images that are being used in the West at the same time, except the Western is applied to them to both Japanese and the Chinese. So uh, this is, um, a lot of this is in here, but it's a very complex story. What you can do with the new media, which is fascinating to me because I'm a low-tech person until I began to do this, uh, is with the new media you can literally move into the prints and graphics and look at small details in ways that are very hard if you're looking even at the actual object and which are almost impossible when you're looking at reproductions in books. You can pull things out and see how things are going on. What happens is that Ten year, and this is the way Japanese tend to know the war at, in 1894-95. They were not using a lot of photographs, although photographs of war were being issued at the time. They weren't available in huge quantity in Japan. Um, and then comes the Russo-Japanese War, and the same artists return to do woodblock prints of the Russo-Japanese War, and a very interesting thing happens. They start out with a burst of Russo-Japanese War prints, and it fizzles and disappears. So that by the end of the war, there's almost no war prints. And it caught me by surprise until I moved into the next unit, which I will show you, which is the next thing that we did, I'm going to introduce you to three units, is picture postcards. Because what happens in the world, just as technology, that we heard about this incredible war technology, to become Western is to master technology, and technology is very much connected with war. But the technologies are changing in every area, including communications and printing techniques. And what happens between the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War is that photographs become widely accessible through mass reproduction. They were available earlier, not so much. Now you have photographs that everyone can see. You can reach the mass audience. And at the very turn of the century, in the early 1900s, countries throughout the world change postal uh, regulations so that private manufacturers can produce postcards. Up until that time, they were usually produced by governments, and they were simply blank cards. You wrote the address on one side and a message on the other. And Japan is following the pattern in the world. So at the beginning of the 20th century, postal regulations are changed, and picture postcards appear on the scene. And suddenly, throughout the world, beginning around 1902, 1903, Everyone is reproducing photographs and drawings and paintings on postcards, and they can reach a mass audience. And that's when the whole world of collectors comes up, pen pals comes up, and so on. And this new mass audience is the way the Japanese and the rest of the world see the Russo-Japanese War. And the Russo-Japanese War is the first great international event that the whole world is looking at, as you mentioned. The whole world is looking at this, this war, and they're looking at it in good part through postcards. So suddenly we have a moment when the, the postcard has emerged as a new vehicle of communication. You have a single colossal world event, 
and you can move around it and look at it through the eyes. We can now, literally, the way people were portraying it at the time. So the next two units that I'll, I'll move into and what I want to spend time on tonight is how were the Japanese seeing the Russo-Japanese War through postcards, and then how was the rest of the world portraying the same event through postcards. And most of these have never been seen before. It's very exciting to, to sort of have the technologies to get into this. But before I do that, let me just show you these are the types of, I'm going to run very quickly, you all can get into this later. But to give you an idea, it, 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 this idea of weaving a lot of text around the graphics and the maps and so on, um, <coughs> this is the unit on, uh, on the Russo-Japanese War. I think if, for those of us who do teaching, and particularly any kind of teaching, certainly not just university, at any level, whenever you do something like Japanese expansion, the Sino-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War, it's very important to point out it's the age of imperialism. This is the age of imperialism. This is the name of the game. If you want to be a, Western, a westernized power, you, ha you have to be an empire. You want to be an empire. You want to have a strong military. There's this rare print sitting in, uh, never seen it before, never seen it reproduced. It was n in fact, I had it reproduced, um, sitting in, uh, in the MFA, which is uh, uh, Admiral Dewey in the Philippines in 1898. It's the American conquest of the Philippines. So it, it's put into the unit to remind you that between the, the Sino-Japanese and the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese are looking out and they're saying, we've got to move, otherwise Asia will be taken over uh, by the others. So we, we, we tuck in these kind of little visuals and we can tell little stories about them. We have the army movements, we have some cross-references. Um, now, this becomes very interesting and particularly, this is almost the very beginning of the war. What <coughs> And if I were only doing this unit with you, I would have set this up by sh showing the Chinese graphics where no one could be different, more different than the Japanese and the Chinese in every way. The Japanese faces are rectangular. They, they have Western-style facial hair. They, have, they look like this all the time, whereas the Chinese have round faces where the cues wear very garish clothing uh, and are usually in positions of rather grotesque and humiliating. The minute the war with Russia begins, this print comes out almost the very beginning uh, of the war, February 1904, which is the officers on both sides and, and the troops in their uniforms and how they look, and they become very, very similar. And this is the kind of reaching in and pulling out the detail that you can do. So we, we're setting up that there is a kind of equality here, which you don't see much. Uh, they do um, a great deal about Japanese humanitarianism, particularly through Red Cross and care of prisoners, which comes out very strongly in the postcard, so I'll pick that up later. Uh, but they also uh, <coughs> try to show how they're very good in treating Russian prisoners, whereas the Russians tend to be more crude toward and cruel toward uh, local people. Amazing prints that, I, uh, to my knowledge, have never been seen. Uh, uh, they, they read a report, the, the artist, that uh, a train that had, tracks had been laid across Lake Baikal and the train had fallen through the ice and so the Russians fell into the ice. And you've got to understand that this, these things are being tossed out within a few days. They get the news from abroad and they toss out a picture. It's all imaginary but they're tossing out the images. Uh, this is uh, the great Kiyo Chika who, who comes back, the man who I showed you that grid. Uh, the torpedoes you mentioned, you know, the torpedo striking, uh, <coughs> striking the Russian boat, one of the legendary heroes, a very unusual type of triptych, which is vertical rather than horizontal, uh, of the mines that are being laid to sink the boat. So the, the fascination of the prince for technology that this is showing our prowess and, and our modern prowess in modern war is very, very great. Uh, so so we, we, we move through these kind of prints. Uh, actually, they're, they're, they're interesting, but they're very boring if you have seen the Sino-Japanese war prints because all the imagination went into the Sino-Japanese war prints. And this is all very kind of redundant, but they're very lively, as you can see, the naval prints, the uh, uh, the battles and so on. Then 
you're able to do things with this kind of work and again with, the, with this new medium. This is a print from the Sino-Japanese War, 1894-95, and this, of course, is the fantastic modern Japanese with their mo mastery of modern weaponry, and this is the Russo-Japanese War print. And so what they're doing is basically taking the motifs that they've established. We are modern, we have the modern technology, and they are bringing it up and just redoing it here. Now, since this went up, and this went up about a month ago, uh, Ann uh, Moss, the curator at um, MFA, just published a little book. You can take this further back. This picture she found is clearly copied from a photograph in the Illustrated London News in the 1890s of the British by their big machines. <laughs> the way in which you, you quote, the way in which you get the patents becomes very, very interesting and in how we can set them up and see them. But we have this, this borrowing from the, um, from the earlier things. These are very just familiar themes. Uh, then the quoting actually, and these are, are things quoting or plagiarizing. Uh, this would probably, if students did it, uh, you know, would, would come under the rules of plagiarism. This is a print from the Sino-Japanese War, and in the Russo-Japanese War, they literally reproduced the same print and changed the flags. <laughs> Now these were these these were sitting in the um, in the uh, both of these prints were sitting in the uh, in the MFA, but no one had and people curators knew it, but no one had ever visually put them together. It's the same thing. This is uh, the Sino-Japanese War, the dead Chinese figure, very typical. The contrast between the Western style, disciplined, highly regimented Japanese, heroic, and uh, all, you know the throwing off China, throwing off Asia. And this is the identical print. This is the Russo-Japanese War. The figure has just been turned into a Russian, and they have added Russians to this. They were running dry. They were running dry on their uh, images. Um, and, you know, we just, we, we go through this. Uh, and they produce prints which are even when they are, you know, they're often cutting down and, and, and uh, uh, the Russians em emerge, they're often belittled and, and always the Japanese are heroic, but you do get prints where the Russians emerge as very similar. Even in this kind of a print, there is an identity and in fact that's certainly a very handsome, almost a tragic picture uh, uh, where you see a kind of identity between uh, the two sides here. This is uh, Kuropatkin, uh, General Kuropatkin, uh, which is a pure heroic image of the Russian general, uh, which you can find this, and I, I bent over backwards to see, to find this as well in the Sino-Japanese War, and you can find pictures which complement Chinese, but nowhere in the same way. Uh, this, again, is, um, <coughs> you know, is a famous battle. This. Uh, uh, he goes down, the Russian admiral, he's identified in the print, goes down with the entire fleet, and it's, it's clearly um, with the entire crew, 800 men uh, go. This is in, uh, you know, the battle you mentioned, Tsushima. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is earlier in the war. And, um, but it is a more heroic type of thing. At the end, and that, that unit concludes with a graphic that had never been seen there, there's all this emphasis on the West, but the other side, of course, is when they're pumping up their nationalism, they have to also reassert, and this comes very hard on the heels of these developments, they have to reassert their own uh, identity. And um, right at the same time, you have the Japanese man. This is 18, uh, around 1895. I'm sorry, 19, uh, this is 1895, the, I'm sorry, this is 1905, the end of the Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese man suddenly dressed in traditional Japanese clothes and so on, kicking off China and also kicking off or out the West or Russia. So you're able to do many things with this. Now, what, what becomes interesting is, you know, by the end of the war, you don't have 
any woodblock prints of the Battle of Tsushima to speak of because they didn't have the audience. And where the audience went was into, um, into the postcards. And the Japanese postcards of this period were given uh, in a donation to the MFA by Leonard Lauder, the heir of the Lauder Cosmetics, the son of, of the uh, founder of the Lauder Cosmetics firm. He gave a, uh, it's called the Lauder, Leonard A. Lauder postcard collection, which was given to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It's over 20,000 postcards. And they're Japanese postcards, except, and no one has seen them, uh, they include, for the Russo-Japanese War, foreign postcards as well. It's a spectacular collection. It changes our view of Japanese society and culture, visually certainly, unless you're a real expert, you know, and know it, uh, and how modern it was. The collection covers pretty much from the Russo-Japanese War to the early 1930s. And it's just spectacular. And what I've zeroed in in this particular unit is, um, is, the, um, is the Japanese postcards. This is a Japanese postcard of the Russo-Japanese War. And it's stunning. I mean, the, the graphics are st simply stunning. The news of the war, it's almost a, a postcard that in, in its artistic style, in its modern men, their sense of modernity, their sense of arriving, the new sense of mass communications, everything is captured in this type of a graphic. Now, what we did in this unit uh, is to just zero in on the Japanese postcards. And again, I want to run quickly through this and then bring you into um, the uh, postcards of the, um, of the foreign countries looking at Japan. The louder postcards are online and you can get at them. Uh, they're very mixed up, they're chaotic, and they have 1,840 postcards online now from the Russo-Japanese War. 1,840 from the Russo-Japanese War. We have taken out in the core exhibits about 140 or 50 in each of the two units. We will be then hooking into, but this, won't, this link won't go up, we're working on it. This is quite sophisticated high tech. We will then tap that entire database and then we will develop keyword searches so you can actually go through the databases and pull things out in very sophisticated ways. You could now, any of you interested in this, see those 1,800 plus postcards by tapping in. I have this, you know, the, the website. The, the MFA at this very moment is revising their websites, so sometimes they're down, sometimes they're up. Uh, but you can get at that, and we will then later provide a much more sophisticated access in collaboration with them. Uh, in this case, we, w there are various things. There's these big core exhibits, which I'm taking you through now. Then we develop smaller visual narratives, which are like little stories that are good for teachers to use. Uh, we do, we haven't done yet, but we've done animations, which are things that actually unfold. Uh, then we have the database collections and eventually the uh, lesson plans for teachers and everything will be tucked into these kind of repositories. But the key, again, is the core exhibit. And um, once again, we, you know, it's the same general. It's the same um, general format. Um, Now, I haven't, um, we don't do much with pictures, but we call, this section's called The Well-Watched War, and what, what I did do was try to give people a sense of, um, my link's down, um, I can't do it, but if you clicked, I'm sorry, wait, no, if you clicked on here, let me see, yeah, I can do it. Uh, this is just the way we, we can give people uh, a sense of the photographic record. This is the, the, the most, probably the best. This is Hare's book on the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, and we can just, because this is, the copyrights are clear on these, we can give people a sense 
of the type of photography that was being seen in the West at this time. So these are just the types of, I don't, I, 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 if I slow down, we'll be here all night. <laughs> um, I just want to give you a sense of what's in the unit. Um, because uh, it just shows you how many different things we can do with, um, you know, uh, uh, things like this, the Japanese trying to show they're civilized uh, would pay visits to the Russian graves and pay their respects to the Russians and then make sure that these were photographed. Uh, you see, these, these on, this is not a simple uh, just snapshots, the, you know, casual, and the picture, the opening picture was of the, all of those people in that opening picture, and I'll go back to it, are uh, the uh, foreign attaches and others who were embedded with the Japanese army. They traveled with the Japanese army. They were embedded uh, reporters and embedded observers. Uh, but I'm sorry, I put so many in here, I can't get to the end of this. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, these give you a sense of what the photo can do. One of the things that interests me when you say visualizing cultures is not simply who is visualizing it, but what's the medium. So you talk about what's the difference between the photograph and the woodblock print and the western style etching and the cartoon and so on. This is the photo I began with. These are the millet, foreign military attaches and um, newspaper reporters from around the world who are traveling with uh, General Kuroki's army in particular. Uh, uh, these are the big guns and they're, the photos, like everything else, zeroes in on the incredible technology. These are the biggest guns in the world uh, at the time that they were using to shoot down on Port Arthur and take out uh, the fort. But um, these are the types of scenes that you don't get in the woodblock prints and you really have to uh, go into photographs uh, to see. But I just do this to show you the type of um, things that we can do with these sites. Uh, this is something that I'll pick up again later, this terrific emphasis on um, how humanitarian we are, and particularly through our activities in the Red Cross. It's a stunning difference from the Japanese in the 1930s in World War II where they were so atrocious to prisoners and others. They bent over backwards at this time to show that they adhered to the Geneva Accords and to the, all of the other uh, type of uh, humanitarian uh, things. But the, 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 the unit really is, is to show what is really happening apart, uh, aside from this in the um, in the world of, um, of, photo, of, of postcards and picture postcards. This is a woodblock print, and it's from the Sino-Japanese War, and it's Kiyochika, the man who I showed you the grid of. Uh, it's a great print. It's a great, great imaginative print, and remember, he's tossing off two or three of these a week in the Sino-Japanese War. It's the Russian ship sinking, it's the triptych, little bodies are floating through. When we do in that section, we dwell on that in the Sino-Japanese War. It's the only woodblock print, uh, almost the only woodblock print in this unit. The, these, this is a postcard. And it's not one postcard, but three postcards. It's almost the same as Kiyochika's, but this is the new world you're in now. And you're in a world of collectors. You, when the postcards came out, the image was on one side, the other side was for the address. If you wanted to write a message here, you would have had to write it on here. But they are putting out these cards, so this is, this is the image, and they are putting them out obviously not just for communication but for collectors. And they're being shared internationally. And if you look at the graphics here, it's the same picture, but it's stunning. It's a whole new world of modernity and visual representation. They take things like, um, and this again is the set of series that we're now putting things out. You see, anyone can be a collector now. Prints, lots of people could collect, because you could run runs of, you know, a couple of thousand prints. So lots of people could collect prints. But postcards make it possible to be 
international cosmopolitan and a collector very, very inexpensively and to start sharing these things and to collect them. So these are, this is a scatter of postcards. This is the picture that these postcards create. And what's interesting is we have found, Lauda found, and MFA is dying to find, one postcard has never been found from this set. And it's clear it's this one because there's a gun coming in here. If you, this is just, uh, this is just a new world of, of visual representation. This is the woodblock prints which are, are, are too old fashioned now. This is that postcard set when you put it together. And this is very sophisticated. I mean, the, the graphics are spectacular, but it's montage. They're mixing photographs with drawings. It's just the most sophisticated. No one in the world in the Russo-Japanese war cards is more sophisticated, in my view, than what we see coming out of the Japanese at that time. This is just extraordinary. <coughs> now, I have the email of the person for you to contact <laughs> <laughs> when you find this card, and the MFA will probably pay you a king's ransom because they are just, they just have not found the card and they are dying to find it. But what you see here, of course, we think of a postcard as a postcard or this is, this is art. It's popular art, it's commercial art, uh, but it's also a whole new world of representation. This is uh, the old fashioned, this is a Russo-Japanese war print from the very beginning of the war. It's not Tsushima, the very beginning of the war. And, uh, you know, the, the woodblock print by comparison, suddenly, frankly, it looks boring. It's not as interesting anymore. It's old fashioned. Uh, and you can see just a sea change taking place in late Meiji, early 20th century uh, Japan. Then you get into the whole cult of the variety of the cards. Uh, and I just used one, this section is called Heroes and Heroines. Uh, just Admiral Togo, who certainly is, he's the great naval uh, victor of the battles at the beginning and particularly the end of the war. He's the man who leads to that annihilation of the Russian fleet, Admiral Togo. He is without question the supreme military hero in Japan to the present day, the supreme modern military hero to the present day. But you can see the many, and there's just scores of them, you can see the many different ways in which uh, Togo is represented. And if you look very closely, th this is Admiral Togo. This is very Western. This is not a, 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 a Japanese uh, uh, thing. Uh, we have the sort of the doves of peace on this great f figure. And then we have a Japanese poem. And what does it say? Russian warships scattered like autumnal leaves. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, moment of fusion. We have, uh, just, as, just to give you a variety, a sense of the variety uh, with which these people can uh, be presented, the, the, the sense of artistic innovation. Uh, much of it uh, is very Western. This is the heroines, and the great heroines are the nurses. And what they're doing with, uh, this is the one figure, there are many, many cards of all kinds of Japan as part of the International Red Cross doing, uh, taking care of prisoners. And what gets, uh, you, you can see how extraordinarily modern this is, but also there's a touch that's traditional, you know, you know in these kind of, of pictures. Um, and then what happens is that this gets, mixed up with the tradition of uh, paintings or portraits of BG, beauties. And it gets mixed up with a kind of a sense of pinup girls. And so you get people sending cards to the men on the front and so on with a pretty nurse on them. Uh, so you get many things going on here uh, at the same time. Then they have cards which are hold this card to the light. And as you can see, this is a Japanese card, but it has 
Amer uh, English writing on it because the Japanese have a very good sense of the international audience. And if you hold it to the light, this is the card, when you hold it to the light, you see this beautiful nurse is tending a wounded man in bed. And if you look very carefully, he has a gigantic nose like I do. He's obviously a foreigner. He's obviously a Russian. You see, so it's not only you've got the, the beijing here, but you also have the notion that we care for the Russian prisoners. We treat them very, very well. And in fact, this becomes a major theme that you can find in, in many forms in Japanese postcard art. Many of the Japanese postcards will have Japanese and English, wounded Russians in the Red Cross Hospital at uh, Chem, uh, Chem Julpo, uh, which is one of the, which is in the in the battlefront. Uh, so uh, our soldiers conveying wounded Russian soldiers to the Red Cross Hospital once again at Chemulpo. Um, so you have these this real sense of us being uh, well. What are they doing here? They're teaching the prisoners calligraphy. Uh, they're having a party with the Russian prisoners. They're celebrating uh, a Russian uh, festival. And then many, many photos uh, which are after battle photos because of course the officers are, are the same. They're elites. And so after the battles, uh, which usually are end in Russian defeats, the officers come together and there is a sense of camaraderie almost. And you have a sense we are now standing among the great Western leaders um, and great um, officers uh, of the West. And not only that, but we've defeated them. There, there can be no such pictures uh, in any sense uh, comparable to this where the Chinese were concerned. We move on uh, to um, uh, Uh, I gotta, I've got to go fast because I want to get you into the foreign ones. But just to give you a sense, the variety is extraordinary. The imagination and variety in these cards and the appeal to collect is just extraordinary. I'm going to skip this section because it's, it's celebrating Japanese victories, but I, I, I want to get into other things. They, they have cards which look like woodblock prints. They have many things of heroic things in the battle. Uh, but <coughs> and the variety is enormous, but then they go home to show what's happening um, on the home front. And wait, let me go back here for one sec. I want to get something at the end here. I will go through this. I, I want to show you a couple of other things here. <laughs> They're sort of mocking the Russians here. We get you know, big battle scenes here that are similar to um, woodblock prints. We, I show here, we show here how the photography, which you usually think of seeing them in magazines or periodicals, they're really seeing a lot of them through the postcards. So they're reproducing the big guns. This is the spoils. These are the big guns, the Russian guns that they bring back and put in front of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. Look what we've captured. These are our war spoils. Um, we are victory, victorious in these conflicts. These are the uh, types of scenes that are quite extraordinary when they tint the pictures a, a, a wounded sailor in a full body cast. They have the people are seeing the war in ways that they, you know, have never seen before. Then they move into things which are very, very Japanese, which is the combination of the photography and the artwork, where they frame or combine or fuse artwork and photography. And then they move into a realm of modern art. This is 1904, 1905. That is simply a knockout. They are moving into uh, styles of art that are really quite remarkable. Throwaway popular commercial art. Um, <coughs> going through the Russian St. Andrew's flag the sailor just goes through and behind it is Japanese victory. I mean, this is absolutely brilliant throwaway design. Uh, a, a, a card like something you'd hang on the wall 
you know, a sort of a, a graphic poster. It's a Russian ship. It's not a Japanese ship. It's a Russian ship. And it's become, war is beautiful, beautiful modern war. Um, and you, you should uh, understand it, that it's this aesthetics, the aesthetics of war. Um, they, you know, self-referential things like um, postcards of postcards. <laughs> These are all a scattering of postcards against an incredible sea scene. Uh, the, um, Every one of these really bears analysis. And remember, this is just a tiny fraction of what's in the collection. Uh, underwater mines turned into design elements. So they, they move through these kind of, of, of graphics, these um, <coughs> of the, the army, uh, and then a lot of cavalry pictures. The pictures like this are absolute knockouts. The perspective, the whole concept of this, of this little design is simply uh, extraordinary. These are all just cavalry type uh, of pictures. Uh, and then, now, what you're seeing here, this is handwriting. This is the message. Remember, you can't write the message on the other side. The other side is for the address. So this was actually a card that was sent, and that's the message. This is a card that, if the person had chosen to send it rather than collect it, the message would have been written in here. Uh, this is the, the hero, the, the warrior as hero. Um, and this is a young schoolgirl giving a flowers to the warrior's hero. Now, then they move into the uh, celebrations back home. And this is where you move into some very interesting, very modern art. Um, you, you, they do recognize the, the widow, the orphan child. This is Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, these are ceremonies to the war dead. But mostly, it is the home front. So these are all war photos, but it's the home front, the women back home, the youngsters back home, um, <coughs> you know, sewing the famous uh, thousand-stitch belly warmer, where, you know, we, we we often write about this when we write about World War II, where the, uh, the belly warmer this, this would be moved to women in the community, and in theory, a thousand women would each sew in and tie a stitch. Then it would be sent to the soldier in the front who would wear it, knowing that he had the support, literally, of the community back home. So we have these kind of things from the Russo-Japanese War. These are the schoolgirls, and here, of course, the whole message could be written here. The schoolgirls uh, lined up. Uh, these are Japanese women, purely Western, uh, seeing the soldiers off at, uh, uh, to the front. Uh, and then they begin to celebrate the um, celebration of the war. In other words, they're celebrating the new modes of communication and what a thrill victory is back home. In more traditional drawings like this, this is a good sense of a woman in who's running a shop in which they're selling the old-fashioned woodblock prints, they're selling the postcards, uh, the, the newspaper men are running around hawking the news, uh, and you have people in Western dress and uh, people in more traditional dress, and a whole vogue of cards about celebrating the news or celebrating victory. What becomes uh, very, very interesting in these cards. These are rival newspapers, rival newsboys, butting heads as they're trying to get their versions of the news out. And then they move into the simply the most modern renderings of where they are. This is this, our signature graphic, which you saw at the beginning, which I still think is one of the most remarkable uh, pieces of work. Just brilliant, uh, the way they've done it. But Look at the, the set. these are the kiosks where news of the front has been posted. This is where handwriting from someone who sent the card has been. See how modern the figures are. Now, you must keep this in mind because we're going to move into how the foreigners are seeing the Japanese in the same period. The Japanese are seeing themselves as, in every way, extraordinarily modern. When they celebrate, they have their celebrations. They're often called chochin or lantern celebrations. 
the paper lanterns that you can also light so they're illuminated at night. But you can see how in their rendering, how modern and Western the people in the celebrations are, and they may be dressed both Western style or Japanese style. But the, the sense that we have really um, made it, we have become very modern, riding on bicycles, men riding on bicycles to go to uh, the lantern uh, parades. When the war ends, uh, th there's Russo-Japanese War postcards uh, of two sorts that come out commemorating the war. Uh, the Battle of Mukden in, in, in March 1905, uh, the, uh, that becomes the end of the, the battle, uh, I can't remember, March 10th maybe, I'm not sure if it's the 10th, becomes Army Day in Japan and to the end of World War II is celebrated as Army Day, the, the victory in Mukden. And uh, the Battle of Tsushima, the great victory of Admiral Togo in uh, May 27th, 19. 05 becomes Navy Day in Japan so that every, every year you have the commemorations and right after the war they issue commemorative postcards particularly on those days. And so for uh, a period after the war you have the commemorations. Now an interesting thing happens in the commemorations. Most of the postcards are very modern and up to date. What I've shown you I think is a very fair and representative sample. Um, but right after the war, you get them using much more traditional, traditional symbols. Even this goes back to mythic stories. If we r did this pop-up, which I'm not going to do, there's a whole run where they're picking up samurai images, images of the divine founding of the country by uh, the grandson of the grandson of the sun goddess, uh, pictures of deities in shrines, and it's it's, in a sense, re-invoking tradition again for the martial tradition in the wake of the war because you've got to pump up the nationalism in a new way. But at the same time, they start doing this. Now, these cards are commemorations of the victory. And they have almost nothing to do with the war. But they are issued and they are celebrating Japan's arts and crafts and trades this one happens to be celebrating textiles, cocoons, um, moths, uh, textile, uh, silk, the silk, um, the um, mulberry leaves. Uh, the next one, which looks very Western, the lute, um, uh, the music, it's Kimigayo. It's the, um, it's the song that becomes used as a national anthem. And so they begin to uh, use very modern images that almost seem to have nothing to do with the war uh, to celebrate the war. She is holding up the wreath of victory. This, um, <coughs> these are commemorations. This is, um, uh, you can read it, Nippon Banzai. Um, this is a Japanese woman playing the shamisen. Uh, they're celebrating Admiral Togo here and she's sitting on it looks like a lantern or a cushion, which is the British flag. She's also celebrating the Japanese-British alliance, uh, similarly here. Um, and so you get these very, very modern commemorative issues, brilliant commemorative cards. Uh, you know, this is a run again for collectors. This is the Russian fleet coming in. The whole border is the Russian flag. This is when the two fleets merge, but this is 1906. So half is the Japanese, half is the Russian fleet. And then victory is the Japanese victory, but see the sinking Russian ship? Just the tiny remnants of the Russians are left. This is very, very sophisticated. Uh, and this is, uh, they begin to pick up uh, the European, a lot of it is Art Nouveau in Europe, uh, stained glass window patterns. Now what becomes interesting, which we can't go into, is you say they're picking up European art artistic fashions like Art Nouveau, but Art Nouveau was influenced by exposure to Japanese prints and to Japan. You're getting into a real dialectic here. Japan is part of this very dynamic uh, modernity. Um, these are all just commemorative types of postcards. This is the final one. This is um, 
uh, for, for the Japanese. This is the three ways in which if you're collecting you may find a, uh, a postcard. One is the postcard with the message written. This happens to be a message written to a wounded so uh, a military man in the hospital saying, thank you for your sacrifice, I hope you uh, recover. This is the pristine card. This is the card as a collector might get it with a stamp and a cancellation so he can have it as a collector's item. And this is a symbol of the unity of the military forces. Now, what, when you come through this, which what is very striking is the incredible sense of modernity, how modern we are. So the question becomes, what are the, what are the non-Westerners, um, what are the uh, foreigners seeing? How are they seeing the war and how are they seeing the Japanese at the same time? The louder collection, I never counted it, has as I said, over 1,800 Russo-Japanese War postcards, they're about half and half, Japanese and non-Japanese. There are almost no American postcards in the collection. The, the foreign postcards are primarily Russian, English, French, um, German, and some Italian. Um, they are fascinating and they have never, never been reproduced. Uh, in, in a big way before, uh, and I, would, I found them particularly interesting, and I found them interesting in, in a couple of ways. I think this is the moment, and this is the vehicle through which we can see <coughs> more vividly than I had, I could see more vividly than I had seen before, the complexity of the foreign response to Japan's victory, which ranges from admiration that Japan has indeed made it. This is now the great power. They are the Yankees of the Pacific, or they're, you know, they're our, Brit our ally, if you're a Brit, uh, to uh, very contemptuous types of images, the Mikado, the curious backward uh, uh, people, uh, to the most extraordinary burst of yellow peril, outright yellow peril. Uh, graphics. The French are particularly powerful on, on, in the postcard medium on the yellow peril. Uh, but the French are also equal opportunity cynics. They're, they're very harsh on the Russians as well. Uh, they're very, very sophisticated. I would say if you look at the postcards as a whole, the Japanese and the French are by far the most sophisticated. Uh, but the, the European cards uh, give you a sense of something very, very different, and I'll try to move quickly, although they're very, very uh, fascinating. This is the sense of the world. This section is called the Well-Watched War. Uh, this is the postcard of the conflict. China, Manchuria are just receding from the scene, and Europe is fascinated uh, by this war. And then the Italians don't have many, but if you, if you think of collecting or something, they have a wonderful historical sequence, and here it is, which is how did we get to the Russo-Japanese War? Well, the, in 1894, there's no captions whatsoever, you just have to know it, the 1894-95, uh, the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese kicked out the Chinese from Port Arthur. Here's the way the sequence goes. So. <coughs> The Japanese kicked out the Chinese, the Russians and the triple intervention kicked out the Japanese, the Russians sat there, a little bottle of vodka. Uh, the Russians, the Japanese did a sneak attack, crept up behind the Russians, uh, did an attack on them from behind, the surprise attack on Port Arthur, and the Russians, the Japanese now kicked the Russians out of Port Arthur. The European cards are very interesting because we often can't tell what country they come from. This is a German card, obviously. Um, it, the, the, the European cards are much more keen on the, in, the power politics behind the war. So this is Russia, the Russian bear, and there's France, little hat hanging on his tail. <laughs> And this is the Japanese. Uh, they seem to be wearing a sort of Chinesey gown, but that happens very frequently. And that's the British backing up 
the Japanese saying, yes, all right, um, with a battleship on their head. That's the Anglo-Japanese naval alliance. And then, of course, you have the graphics here. But clearly, the same card, the same author, the same card or the same series appears in French. And it's often very hard to tell who the producer was. So that you come back to uh, France, this is a French, the end of the war, and this is the debts that uh, Japan has incurred, the, the terrible debts that uh, Russia has incurred. They're both bloody, they've left carnage, the vultures behind them. France is still, France was financing Russia much of, and, uh, and Britain, which was along with America, providing so much of the financing for Japan, are uh, now distraught behind them. Then there is a whole vogue of cards, and this goes to show you that the postcards also show us moving into a world of internationalization that, that's really something very hard to see, literally see as vividly. These are cards with uh, the captions in seven different languages. I don't know where they're produced. I don't know who in Europe could have produced um, their Japanese, Russian, French, Italian, English, German, and Spanish. And the Japanese is very good Japanese. And that, so somebody is able to get the Japanese and the Russian alphabets and print them up. The, the series, uh, it's the Battle of, um, um, <coughs> it's the, uh, the bottom is the Battle of Mukden and the, 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 the top which is very famous, is the death of Admiral Makarov. Uh, they're very Western style, very sophisticated paintings and postcards. Uh, these are uh, cards that emerge, go out in three languages, um, French, German, and English. So you really are, are going across borders. Then you get, and these were almost the first cards I saw, because I've seen the real cards, not just online. And when I went in to see the collection, they were actually sitting there like in shoe boxes, saying Russo-Japanese War foreign. No one was looking at them uh, at that time. And I opened them up, and these were some of the first cards to come out. And these are, struck me as very interesting. It's a series that is in both English and German. It's the same series, but there are both English versions of it and German versions. And the Japanese leaders, this is the emperor, and any of us who work there know who these people are. These are very flattering images of the, West, of the Japanese as distinguished leaders like the, the leaders of the West. And so you have these kind of cards coming out in several languages. And then this is a French series, which isn't always just Russian and Japanese, but many of them are when you get to where the Russians and Japanese are being portrayed, very fair, very even-handed, very balanced on, on these types of uh, portrayals. The next um, section is what we call postcard realism, and this is where uh, you, they are both with graphics and with photographs. Uh, what we call realism. Now, one of the things that is very interesting if you're doing this as a teacher, and if we had time to do it, is photos don't necessarily tell the truth. Uh, what is realism? What's staged? What's bogus? What's so highly selective it isn't really fair? But there is a kind of a graphic realism. Here's the peace conference and the, the dignitaries with why you need peace because of the incredible horrors of that war. Uh, <coughs> huge, huge, as you most of you know, casualties. Uh, photographs of various kinds that bear certain analysis, which I'm not going to do with you. Some of them are quite cremations, executions. Some of them, these are English, uh, quite uh, dramatic. These are the kinds of cards the Russians are churning out, um, both parades at home, the landscape, uh, the troops, uh, the Cossacks. Japanese troops, quite fair of the Japanese troops, and then very touristy uh, Chinese acrobats, Chinese uh, opera, and so on. Then the Italians, God bless them, um, do completely fake uh, photographs. Uh, <coughs> this is the, 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 the capture of a, of a Japanese spy and his execution. All I could think of was Tosca. All I could think of was, where's the soprano jumping off the, uh, 
jumping off the, um, <coughs> the, the balustrade uh, here. Uh, these are British postcards. Now, many of you are familiar with printed magazines like, um, um, or, or the books of the war, like Japan's Fight for Freedom or the Russo-Japanese War uh, books or Illustrated London News or so on, which have fantastic uh, drawings and photographs. They're very, very good. But they're always black and white. What happens is the postcards, when they come to the postcards, they color them. And they'll often even say, based on a drawing by so-and-so. So when you move on, you get very, very uh, dramatic. These are British. Um, these are very dramatic battle scenes. These are what you usually see in publications in black and white. But the postcards have, have introduced uh, the whole realm of color to this. And they pick up these themes again. These are, are postcards based on photos. And they say so very explicitly. Uh, from a photo by, and they give the photographer's name, which are the Japanese praying at Russian graves, which we saw earlier, and then things that you'd never seen before, painting marks on Chinese coolies, identifying marks on the laborers. You know, I, we, it, many things that we, we can puzzle out, what do these mean? This is the type of French postcard, almost like a news reportage, very realistic. Very interesting on, uh, you know, the, the religious dimension, the, the, uh, the priests traveling with the Russian troops, uh, scenes that look like they came from a novel of the civilians being bombarded, Russian civilians in Port Arthur, uh, and so on. Um, but what's most interesting is the cartoons of the war, the foreign cartoons, and uh, this is a Russian run. And it's amazingly sophisticated. And any of you, um, you know, who know Japan or know the war will be able to recognize, you know, Yamagata and Oyama, uh, Admiral Togo, the Emperor. Uh, very, very interesting uh, run of caricatures by the Russians. Um, very, uh, not demeaning, very, very skillful. Uh, Admiral Nogi, Ito Hirobumi. Uh, then you get into, and I need, I haven't translated these, I, I'm going to welcome some help from people here, but we haven't got a trans, uh, translator uh, yet to help us with some of these. Um, uh, the Russian postcards belittling uh, the Japanese, uh, little mongrel uh, uh, cooked lobsters, uh, blowing them up, which never happens, mocking uh, the Americans with their big purse um, and little Lilliputian little Japanese clamoring for American money. Uh, the, the Japanese with, with their um, <coughs> dealings with America, among others. Now, one of the major tropes that always comes up, one of the major images is always uh, David and Goliath. That is to say, the Russian giant and the uh, little Japanese. And the little Japanese is just such a powerful cliché. This run exists in both blank cards, which would have traveled everywhere, and cards with a German captions. So whether it originated in Germany or whether the Germans took it over and put their own captions on it simply isn't clear from the metadata that they have. These are, uh, we get into the Russian bear, uh, this is uh, quite charming. The Russian bear is being pissed on by the little Japanese dog. Um, <coughs> and um, that's French. The, if it's really, really, if, it, if it's really wicked funny, it's French, almost, almost always. Um, <coughs> and uh, then, you know, really Tom Thumb, Jack, uh, or, or Gulliver type of images. Uh, and in this, if it's English, always, what a surprise. What a surprise that they really have succeeded in knocking the Russians off their pedestal, that little man. But of course, what happens is that the giant killer kills the giant. The giant killer is in the business of killing. 
and he takes the trophy. And then you begin to move into the fact it's not just a game, it's not just a game. And so you move into these types of, these are French cartoons where the Japanese have taken, and it's, all, it's usually the Tsar, Nicholas II, they have taken Nicholas as a trophy and very sophisticated cartoons in which they have taken Nicholas as a trophy and these uh, are the great victories that this is the emperor's head, but it's also the sun, uh, and, and uh, they, this, is, this is the trophy. But it is taking place at the same time that Russia is exploding internally with revolution and internal uh, dissent. So this is Russia going down. But what we are beginning to see is, of course, the yellow peril in these graphics. And then when you move on, uh, we, will, we will move on to, uh, to other Russian ones. Uh, but before I do that, these are the British. Now the British uh, did some of those very realistic ones, but the British are, I would say, it's probably fair to say that they are very uh, sophomoric in their racism. Uh, that they, there is always in the British the sense of the Mikado you know, how curious are the Japanese, uh, and the mock in front of them. And the British, even though you have the Anglo-Japanese alliance, there is always that sense that the Japanese are really backward and primitive. I mean, these are the British type of graphics. The Japanese are underdeveloped, agrarian, barefoot people. Uh, and you move from that in the British to the absolutely quintessential Mikado type images with every cliche in the book. Uh, you know, if you go through it, you've got Fuji, you've got cherry blossoms, you've got stone lanterns, you've got Shinto gateways, you've got red suns, you've got little pine trees. Uh, they don't miss a thing. Uh, and they, the, the Japanese women are doll like, I am not a Russian. It's just terribly sophomoric uh, humor. And it moves into, and these are series, as you can see, these are series that have many cards into pure, the Mikado kind of juvenilia. Mikado happens to be very funny. This, this is very hard. Uh, bamboozled. That's a joke. Why aren't you laughing? Bamboo? Bamboo, bamboozled. Uh, it's not very funny, but uh, it, it is uh, clever little Jap. Uh, Jappy rushing him everywhere. And always this uh, very campy, effeminate uh, sort of a Japanese male uh, figure. So the British do a great deal of this. This is one of the, of the, uh, the British do of, of Koreans, which just has every cliche uh, in the book associated usually with China and uh, Japan. The queue, the long mustache, the slanted eyes, the buck teeth, the long fingernails, the folding fan, and of course, uh, yellow. And you can just go on and on. It's very offensive. It's very um, sophomoric. Uh, it's juvenilia. The French, on the other hand, are interested in bare rear ends. Um, and um, so um, <coughs> the French, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a very funny subject, which is dysentery among the troops, which is a devastating thing because it kills people. Uh, but this is the Japanese army, and they're running into battle with their, uh, their um, chamber pots, and then this is the artillery of General Oku. Uh, we had a lot of trouble running, uh, writing the captions for this because I had to think of how many different ways to say rear end <coughs> without and still be able to pass the uh, pre-university school boards. Um, so, um, but we have uh, the music of General Oku, and but they're very, as I say, equal opportunity, the French, because this is the Russian, the music of the Russian army uh, as well. Uh, so the French are into this very sort of even-handed treatment uh, to some degree of the Russians, I'm sorry, of the Russians and the Japanese, often personified by the emperor and the czar, and often the czar is the bringer of death, just as the Japanese. And these are very harsh, you know, riding his hobby horse, uh, death, czar, 
uh, Nicholas II grinding out his soldiers that are into falling into the maw of the Japanese, uh, squeezing the very life's blood out of his own people. Uh, the two emperors, uh, when, when they get the upper hand, uh, mockery of the, um, the British and Jumping Jack, the, the pup Japanese as puppets, but the Russians as well are puppets of others. A lot of mockery of the British, uh, uh, you know, I will, uh, I'll help you as soon as he's dead uh, type of thing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is a very famous artist, probably the most infamous, Bijot, B-I-G-O-T, George Bijot, who lived in Japan for many years. Very, very contemptuous portrayals, usually of the Japanese, of the international backing. And Bijot is one of the few people who sort of hopes the Russians will win and predicts that the Russians will win, not hopes. Um, but these are the, the cynicism about power, the cynicism about the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Little Japan is kissing the hand of the British, who of course command the seas around the world, and the British Empire really is death wherever it goes, and uh, this is the nature of the alliance. These are the Brits in Tibet looking at the battle in, in Manchuria and saying what a wonderful spectacle uh, this is. This is the more even-handed uh, patriotism or the homeland, and this is the Russian, uh, the Japanese general, the Russian general, and their people, poor people, the poor people are cannon fodder. Very few graphics that will talk about what was mentioned at the beginning, that uh, the, the real battle is taking place in China and Manchuria, and it is China and Manchuria and Korea that are the uh, real places that are being carved up in the battle. Now, if you look at these, this is very sophisticated, um, and the French are particularly sophisticated on these type of graphics, but it is a very, very, um, <coughs> it is not very far to go from here to the Yellow Peril. This is, a, again, a French graphic. Uh, Roosevelt says in three languages, or says enough genug, uh, it's Roosevelt coming in, peace, the Japanese emperor, the Tsar, Japan, Russia, Japan, not quite as many dead as in Russia, and of course the cross here, not quite as harmed as in Russia. Russia has been literally, you know, severely harmed, Battle of Tsushima, uh, Battle of Mukden, and the loss of Port Arthur. Uh, so you have this kind of a sense of the horrors of war that lie behind the peace conference, but then you move into the yellow peril. Most are, in the postcards, most are French, and they, they work through various levels. I won't go into the details. Some of them, uh, but it's, it's often very explicit that this is the great battle of yellow and, and uh, white. The word yellow peril, as far as we can, as far as I know, comes from 1898 and Kaiser Wilhelm II was gelbe Gefahr. Uh, it was a German concept and it came up in the wake of the Japanese victory over China when it was clear Japan was going to be ascendant. And the first graphics we have date from the late 1800s where it's explicitly talking about yellow. But now you will see it's not only explicit in the graphics, but also often in the captions of the graphics. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the, the Manichaeanism or the, uh, the, the demonism is funny. You know, Saint Russia and Devil Japan, it's, it's, a, it's a real cartoon. Sometimes it is very, very harsh because it is literally the rape of Western civilization. Um, um, the, the at the mercy of Japan, Moscow in flames, whether from domestic uh, <coughs> struggles or the losses against Japan, or of course, uh, both. Uh, so very, very harsh images. Uh, and uh, then you begin to move into the whole stab in the back type of thing, because the war began with the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan uh, sneaking up the surprise attack, the dagger, the stab in the back, applauded by the U.S. and Britain. 
Pearl Harbor is when we think surprise attacks are treachery and infamy. But it was something Japan had done earlier, and we were on Japan's side at that time. These very subtle little uh, yellow peril touches, like usually the long fingernails now are long toenails. It's almost irresistible that they fall into this. And of course, uh, whether it's Oyama or the emperor or whomever, uh, you know, as bloody uh, bringers of death. This is a, a, a very interesting series, which is mostly very balanced between Japanese and Russian figures. It, it's done by an artist named Müller, but it isn't clear whether he was German or where he was operating out of it. Usually has its clearly collector's items, J Russian and Japanese stamps on almost every card. But then suddenly the series ends with uh, the Russians being devoured. The Russians being devoured, you know, setting sun on the Yellow Sea. The very fact that the battles took place in the Yellow Sea suddenly takes on a, a, another level of ominous uh, type of, um, of sentiment. Um, when you move into, here is, uh, you know, Hiro, um, you know, on the right, Hirohito, emperor of the civilized world, uh, facilitator of the Yellow Peril. And there are all his, his the victories over this, the slant-eyed, the buck teeth, but now with fangs, Tsushima, Mukden, now uh, Yao La Yang was a very, very big battle. Port Arthur, uh, the, the emperor's road to victory is a highway. And of course, it's yellow. Sometimes they get out of control. The, the figure is almost um, a Chinese. Uh, it's the triumph of the yellow. It doesn't say much about it. It's, it's the Chinese menace. Japan actually appears to be protecting Russia and Europe against the Chinese. It's, it is being a stabilizing force. Uh, and uh, often the cards, uh, the, it, this is true in World War II, incidentally, uh, the propaganda, the yellow just becomes the dominant uh, color. And then you, you move into cards like this, the place of the yellow, which sort of get all of the images, the feminine, exotic, soft Japan, the backward Japan, uh, but suddenly even that backward country with its contradictory images is running over Russia and threatening uh, England, France, uh, and Germany. Then you get into sequence cards, and th there's only a few left which are simply stunning. They couldn't be more vivid. I, don't, I have not seen more vivid yellow peril materials from this period than I I've found in this particular set. Uh, the yellow peril, the European nightmare, the celestial empire, the old phrase for China. The fear is always that China with it, and Asia with its massive population will take over the world, but the West has technology to hold it at bay. And so there's always that fear, and Europe is kind of, the masses of Asia are rising, and Europe is sound asleep, and suddenly the first, you know, awakening, who the, the peril has come closer. It's now headed by the emperor. Look at the snakes coming at the bed, and only Russia has awakened to, to prevent this kind of a uh, challenge. Uh, then you move into where, you, as you see, the language then becomes not just Japan, but it's the monster of the Orient, some dragon. It's going to vomit up and eat up the whites of the world. Uh, it's Asia against Europe, and suddenly Europe is old and vulnerable in this very Western uh, chimera-type image. But after Russia will come uh, Asia uh, as, a, as a whole. And then just the most extraordinary five-card sequence. Now, when they originally put this up, there were four cards and uh, only, and then very late, uh, when I went back to just double check things, I found they had tucked in more cards. So the last card uh, they put in earlier, and it bears a totally unrelated ID number, as if they don't even know it's a series when they collected it. Uh, but this is perhaps one of the most stunning uh, uh, Yellow Peril series you will find. Five cards, French. Um, <coughs> 
you know, Europe is personified by its leaders or statesmen. Uh, Asia, of course, is not human in the same way. It is, it is uh, Japan or Asia. It is the, the it, there's no captions in the, in the series. It takes off Russia. Uh, uh, it takes off Russia, and then it turns to the other countries of, uh, of Europe. Ta it'll take off France next, uh, the British, the, the, the Germans will, will treat this lightly. They're next on the menu, and this is the way it's all going to end. That's the graphic we use as the signature graphic for this unit. This is the way uh, it will eventually end. And then uh, finally, what perhaps one of the most striking of the yellow peril images. Uh, this, is, this is the last graphic. This is Bijou again, um, the man who I said had lived in Japan for many years. Uh, this was his uh, image. He, he's a very, very problematic man. He, he's the great Western chronicler through cartoons of Japan's modernization in the 1890s. And his contempt for the Japanese is almost palpable. Uh, so it becomes a very, very, many of his pictures are very explicitly racist. The most famous is, uh, which is not in the unit because it's earlier, a Japanese man and woman in Western clothes looking in the mirror and looking out at them is the image of two apes. Uh, so his sense uh, of Japan, which was very influential in Europe because he was, he was living there. Uh, this is his, the empire of Asia and then it's such a stunning graphic, the Russians bow his graphic and add their own captions and perpetuate it that this is their noble cause. That's what I have for you. Um, so you can see if you, if you get a chance to go in here and do it at more leisure with all of the texts and so on, you can get an idea of what a, what a riches are there and then you have 1600 to look at on your own. <laughs> so I think we have maybe just a few minutes for some questions and um, for the question period, we also have a couple people with microphones around, so uh, when you, if, as I call on you, please wait for the microphone to come and, and then uh, speak into it if you could. So if there are any questions? Yes. Would you... Uh, Obviously, you've got a lot of time to discuss this in the next few days, but uh, one of the questions that I, th I hope that you uh, uh, all will address is to what extent this, this visual, this really remarkable uh, display of a visual aspect of history that most of us have never known, never seen. Uh, all right, my, my question really is to what extent this post these postcards and uh, influenced the media in the countries uh, where they were composed, and also to what extent the postcards which were produced by Japan, by Japanese, for a Japanese audience, uh, had their counterpart in postcards the Japanese were producing to persuade the Russians or the Europeans or somebody else that they were noble. Now, there's some of that that you've described, but it seems to me I don't, I don't capture from what you have given us uh, the degree that this art, this uh, wonderful art, uh, had uh, influence over people beyond the, the recipients of these postcards, which, after all, were not very many people. Uh, I think that uh, actually, uh, well, the postcards, the, the postcards, are, there are thousands of postcards being circulated, and the print runs are probably it's not clear, two, three thousand postcards on each run. I, I think what you're seeing here, I think they're reaching a lot more people than ever before in the world. And what's happening here is the postcards uh, are one thing. We can go and there's a very nice ex exhibition at the MFA right now uh, called A Much Observed War. It's very small, has a very nice catalog. 
There are all sorts of other things going on at this time. There are um, magazines are being published with, with photos and drawings in them in the West. There's a lot of this going around. There's a lot of cartooning going around. In fact, the Dickey Center, I think, has about 40 American cartoons up online. There's a lot of cartooning going on in newspapers around the world. There's a lot of magazines that are coming up because photographs are everywhere and these new ways of mass production are everywhere. What's interesting about the postcards is I think they're reaching more people than ever before. I think that they, they're, they're going all over the world. People are seeing them. Uh, they're in three languages. They're in seven languages. The Japanese ones are bilingual. Uh, they're going into collectors' hands, but they're also going into the hands of people who are reproducing images in their own media. And so they're reaching, an, I think, a very large audience. Now, the problem is, it's, if you say, how do we generalize from this? The answer is, it's very complex. You certainly, what you can see is, if you say from the foreign postcards, I think that sample is representative that I gave you of, of the larger sample. You know, I don't think I've just pulled out something. So there's another 1,600 there that'll pretty much fit in those patterns. What, what conclusions can you draw? You can, I think you can draw conclusions that you can reinforce through textual materials, through what people are writing at the time, and so on, that the response, for example, from foreigners depends on who, who's making the response. And you can go in England and say, look at these men, they're, they're like, our, you know, like our distinguished leaders, uh, they're our allies, and you can go right down the line through the Mikado to the, the clever little Jap and the, and the very demeaning images. You can go from the images that are saying this is all a very crass power game to the ones that are saying at the end this is the, this is, this is the yellow peril. And it's the same thing that happens. So you see the very complexity of this. It's the same thing that happens in the US where Theodore Roosevelt has a peace conference in Portsmouth. And the next year, you have anti-Japanese riots in San Francisco, in the San Francisco school crisis. So you, it's very hard to generalize and say they all see them as the yellow peril. It's very hard to say they all see them as the Yankees of the Pacific and the, you know, the the new hope of Asia, because it's a very complex and mixed response. But that yellow peril response that you see there is a hard line that we can trace getting stronger and stronger, you know, through the years. And, and you know, even after World War II. So we can see streams there. I would say you're seeing a level of mass communication now that you haven't seen before. And the postcards are a major part of it newspapers and magazines are, we can reinforce that. You can never see it as graphically, in my view, as you can in the postcards, because they're colorful. They're, they're even more colorful than, you know, if you're looking at the magazines at the time, they're not using color. So you don't get all that yellow. It's, it's when you see the, those graphics that you get all that yellow. So you can catch here, I would say it's very, your question is who's seeing it, and of course, you know, I mean, the answer is more people are seeing these images than ever before. And more people are seeing these photographs than ever before because of new ways of producing. Um, but the, the larger answer is that these same types of images are getting replicated in print and in other things that people are writing. And they reinforce the images that anyone studying racism or, you know, Japan's emergence modern power will have to deal with in the, in the decades that follow. So that whole, um, uh, you know, I, we could take that and add it to the literature we have on the rise of these views. But I work a lot on racism, but it's clear you can take what I just showed you and say, well, look, look, how much of that wasn't racist? How much of that was sensitive? To the I'm talking the foreign ones now. Um, how much of it was, um, you know, really positive, or how much of it was cynical about power politics in general? You can say there are these many other things. The striking thing to me about what I saw is in, these, in the postcards was how the Japanese were celebrating how modern they were. 
And they were. That opera was visible in many cases. And they were celebrating, look how long we are, look how long the day we are. And then you come have someone coming in and saying, can't be on the still, you know. Or showing a picture of someone with a man who happened to be a thief who was just a back of the person. And the rest of the image and the Japanese image of who they are, what we call self and other in the more academic jargon, the, 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 the gap there is really striking. The Japanese are saying, look how modern we are, and the others are saying, look how exotic, look how strange, look how other, look how different they are. And I think you see that very vividly in that reflects larger trends in the time. Can you make me the question back here first? I wonder if I could follow up on, on what you were just talking about and who was saying what. I was struck by the fact that the French seemed to be uh, really driving the yellow peril idea. And I was trying to make sense out of this. And I wondered if it had something to do with the alliance structure of the day that the French had signed an alliance with the, with the Russians in 1894, I think it was, and so were officially allied with, with the Russians and so had some cause, despite the chamber pot pictures, to have some sympathy for what was going on to, uh, with the Russians. Or was it that the French were concerned about their own territorial uh, colonies in, in Asia themselves? Why, why such a strong response from the French? I don't know the answer. I think it's a very fascinating question. I mean, um, and I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to it. I would say the French are the most sophisticated on power politics, and you can go through, and I could do much more on their harshness of Nicholas II as an example of Russian backwardness and barbarism, too. So there is the French, even though they are behind Russia in theory in the war, the French are very cynical about power politics in general. Now, the, the, the British are really much more Mikado-esque, you know, it's, it's a much more juvenile thing. Why most of the yellow peril graphics and the postcards are French, I can't answer because, of course, we can go and look at the stereotyping and the other images in America and in American pop culture or elsewhere and find a lot of yellow peril at that time, but it doesn't emerge in the postcards in that collection. But it raises, I think, it's just an area for study. Can you, can you go back in and, and say something larger if you do a larger study of the images of the time in the different countries? And you gotta, you gotta go beyond the postcards. I'm just showing you those now. But the French, there, there's no question that the most stunning graphics there are, um, are the French and the same person can do a really, really harsh yellow peril image, and like Bianco, the guy who did, the, the artist who did uh, Theodore Roosevelt with the emperor and the czar and the, the mountains of, of, you know, skulls behind them, that was not a racist image. That was not a yellow peril image. The same man can then turn around and do a yellow peril image. I don't know the answer. I leave it to you, younger scholars. <laughs> Okay, for future yeah. research. And you, and get the mic, yeah. you alluded just once to the, the subsequent sort of brutalization of the Japanese self-image uh, in the 20s and, and in the Second World War. We're not going to be talking about it in the conference, so I'll ask you now. Um, I mean, what would explain that? Would it be a reaction to the, the increasing yellow peril the image of Japan uh, in the West, to the disappointment of World War I. I mean, it must have been a complex thing, but there was a coarsening <laughs> and a toughening, and, a, and the Japanese drawing away from that, the image that we've seen, that we're totally Western, we're modern, uh, we're nice, we're gen genteel, we take care of the prisoners, you know, over to this thing that you got in World War II of, you know, harsh, tough, we stand on our own, we're mean, uh, that kind of thing. I don't know the answer to that either. Um, it's, it's, I think what we know is that the Japanese certainly, um, I, there, are, there are answers, but they're not satisfactory. By what, one of the really interesting things, I actually have a quote in my pocket, but I've, I, I didn't have time, so I decided to leave all that out. 
the concept I began with was, um, was throwing off Asia. What they were doing, and this is their words, this is not mine, we are throwing off Asia. And this means we will throw off, you know, our backward past, but we also got to take over China. And the, the, and we make ourselves Western and modern. By the time you get to World War II, and the quote I have in my pocket was from uh, um, one of the great Japanese ideologues in 1943, uh, who's, who goes back to the Russo-Japanese War and says, we, this is where we showed we could stand up. And now, 1943, we have to throw off the West and embrace Asia. And there is certainly a sense by 1940s that you can say that there is a sense of racial revenge in some of that brutality. Uh, but I think that's too simple because, of course, so much of the brutality was toward the Chinese. And we saw that brutality emerge in the first Sino-Japanese War. Why they made the decision not to try to present that face to the world that they did in the Russo-Japanese War. They bend over backwards to show that they are civilized, that they treat the Russian prisoners. The number of postcards on Red Cross and prisoners is very large. And if, uh, picture books also, uh, photograph books. They're bending over backwards to show we are civilized. We're even more civilized than the Russians. We agree to these conventions. They've thrown it off by the 30s and 40s as often, it doesn't matter. And, and that I think you just have to go into the 20s and 30s, they're with the Axis Alliance, they've defined the world differently, they've been socialized, you know, we have theories of transfer of oppression, that they've been repressed, that they are transferring it, I don't know the answer. Well, you also, don't you also, excuse me, have the rise of a, of a new sort of lower middle class or peasant origin leadership, at least in the army? You that would have be, all sorts of things. That would you be have a new vocabulary of, uh, uh, you know, um, your motto race superiority at that time. You're pumping up a lot of our superiority vis-a-vis -vis others. There's just a, but I, I don't know how to explain <coughs> atrocity. I mean, I don't know who, I don't, who of us knows how to explain atrocity because we all do it at certain points. They were bending over backwards at that time, though. And later they abandoned that, <coughs> even the care to do that. Can you still the front? Yes. Somebody else, because we have so many good historians here, may have a good answer to that. The, the one country of origin that we don't yeah, the, the one country of origin here that we don't have images of is the United States. And I'm wondering if you can comment on how the United States portrayed this, because of course, even at this time, China was very much an American obsession with missionaries, with the open door policy. And within the third of the century, of course, the American stereotypes of Asia were demonic Japan and almost saintly China. Does this oh, show sure. up at this sure. time of the time of the No, I think that, the, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated because until uh, two days ago, I. Uh, I had a run in there that were called the American Postcards, and uh, because that's what the data, the metadata from the MFA did. And then, when I blew one up and really looked at it, it had sinking a Russian ship in Chamuco, H A R B O U R, and I said, "Oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, you know <laughs> it's, it must be a British postcard." Uh, so I, the, the answer I think is is the same answer I gave earlier, but I haven't. What I've worked on, what, I, what we use is the Russian, pic, uh, the American picture books and so on, which are pretty even-handed, photo books and things like that. There is uh, a site up here uh, on, on American cartoons, which are pretty mixed. You know, you have very negative uh, uh, images of the Japanese. I think the, it's the same thing. There is always, I think it's fair to say that in the West at the time, the rise of Japan, provokes both admiration and a sense of an ominous threat from Asia. And the, the, the concept of a yellow peril goes back to what I said earlier, which is, you know, it, it comes from the Mongols and the Hordes, but it really comes from the notion, and it's clearly articulated, that the Asian people have the numbers. They have the masses. 
And, you know, they're so mysterious because they speak those languages that are kind of impenetrable to us, but they seem to master other languages. But as long as we have the science and technology, we can hold them at bay. So the initial image is what will happen if China awakens. And when the Sino-Japanese War takes place, at the beginning of the Sino-Japanese War, there's a great deal of expectation in the West that Japan has bitten off more than it can chew and China will be successful. When that happens, China is so humiliated and so, you know, a crush that it is clear that, as we saw in that later picture, that the, the horde is now headed by the emperor and it's closer to us than ever. So Japan has taken over that image of leaderships of the yellows. And, um, but it's always a little blurry in, in, in American eyes. You know, the, the, the pro-Chinese sentiment you're thinking of, if you go back to American graphics at the turn of the century, late 19th, early turn of the century, the anti-Chinese graphics are pretty ferocious. And if you go back to Hearst magazine, Hearst, the Hearst newspapers at the end of World War II run a wonderful cartoon showing how ever since the Russo-Japanese War, they've been predicting that Japan is going to take over the world. And they just say, we did this in 1905, and they reproduce a cartoon, actually, from 1905. But you've got the other side of these plucky little Japanese, these Yankees of the Pacific, these people that we can work with. And Japan emerges as one of the great powers. And then by World War I, they're at Versailles, and they're dealing with the West. And um, I think what happens increasingly in the, as, is in the 20s and 30s, you get real spokesmen for the Chinese, like Pearl Buck, Lin Yutang, the Good Earth. You know, we, we begin to see uh, a picture of Madame Chiang Kai-shek of the suffering Chinese and the Japanese. Uh, we have much more media showing us what the Japanese are doing to them. And increasingly, of course, the technology is getting more and more sophisticated. They're getting it. By the time World War II happens, they've got it. They've got the Zero airplane. They've got those torpedoes. They've got a technology that looks like they're getting closer. That's very pertinent to the present day. I'd just like to say that if people would like to, would like to continue the conversation, we'll have a reception uh, out, out in the lobby for a few minutes. And for now, I'd just like to thank Professor Dower for a wonderful evening. Thank you.